there's a handful of books that have really come to define the way I think about the world. And most of them have been written by Jonathan Haidt. He's an NYU professor and social psychologist. And around 2013, Haidt started to notice a really big change taking place on college campuses, both his and the ones he'd visit as a speaker. And that was this disturbing trend towards closing down discussion and debate. Jonathan Haidt co-wrote an article in The Atlantic magazine titled The Coddling of the American Mind, which went on to be one of the five most read articles in the history of this very old magazine. Soon after our article came out, there was a wave of shout downs and protests and no platforming. So academic life changed pretty quickly. Haidt and his co-author, Greg Lukianoff, followed up with a book of the same name that tried to dig into what was underlying this big transformation in psychology on college campuses and beyond. And what he found was a set of bad ideas driving a dangerous transformation of American culture. So these are the top five ideas I learned, or perhaps we all need to unlearn from Jonathan Haidt. Number five, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. This bad idea is looking to eradicate all those painful rites of passage. They don't get it. Very good. See you guys in the emergency room, huh? <laughs> what we began to see in 2014 is the, the arrival of a kind of a new moral matrix that is a new moral worldview in which students are fragile, the world is dangerous, words and books and ideas can be a kind of violence. Is this good for students or bad for students? If you ever say someone, you know, I hate you because you're so-and-so, that's a, you know, that should not be allowed. In a way, it's free speech, but in a way, again, it's a hate crime. So as I've been traveling around talking with parents and educators, I found that the most important concept, the concept that they most need, the concept that makes everything else makes sense is the concept of anti-fragility. If something is fragile, it breaks and so you protect it. So a wine glass is fragile, we don't give it to a toddler because a toddler is gonna play with it and break it. I broke a glass! Instead we give them a plastic cup because plastic is resilient. If the kid drops a plastic cup, it doesn't break, but it doesn't get better. Anti-fragile refers to systems that have to get dropped, have to get stressed, have to get thrown on the ground, and in that way, they get stronger. Just think about the immune system. It's this incredible product of evolution that prepares our bodies to fight off all kinds of parasites, bacteria, viruses that are new, that evolution didn't prepare us for. But in order to learn, it has to have lots of experience. This one really resonates with me because I have a son and I can't even count how many times he would come home with scrapes all over his knees after falling out of a tree or getting into some rough and tumble fights and coming out the other end a little worse for wear. But you know what? Those bumps and bruises, they're a badge of honor and he's gotten more resilient as a result. Number four, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will traumatize you for life. You will always be a crude, obnoxious, nouveau riche little fleeb. So I was a nerd in high school and I got picked on pretty mercilessly. I had a lot of bad words thrown in my direction, but you know what they didn't do? They didn't actually leave a mark. They didn't physically hurt me. And that distinction really matters. I think some teachers, educators, some well-meaning adults, I think are more of the impression that sticks and stones may break your bones, but those will heal. Words, on the other hand, will traumatize you for life. Now, if you think about it closely, of course it's not true. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never harm me. I don't care what you say. Yeah, it might still hurt, but you learn to use that to say, I don't care about you. And in this way, you develop some toughness, you can push people away. And in the process, you learn how to deal with things yourself, with words, not with, not with violence. Are you aware that I am rubber and you are glue and everything that you say to me bounces off of me and sticks to you? The number three bad idea, always ask for permission first. Obviously, there are plenty of areas of life where you need to always ask for permission. As dads, part of our job is teaching our kids when that's essential, especially in dealing with other people. But the fact is, a lot of life involves making choices for yourself and taking ownership in those choices without looking around to see if there's somebody, whether it's a mom, a dad, a boss, or an authority to give you permission first. Now that Gen Z is entering the corporate world, I'm hearing from business people things like, it's like a light bulb burns out and they don't change the light bulb. They have to tell someone and get permission to change it. Of course, this is not their fault. This is the way we raised them. We told them, always tell an adult. We treated them as though they were incompetent and fragile. And in a sense, we might've made them that way. Number two, safety first, best, and always. 
safety dance! You can dance. You can dance. Everybody look at your pants. This is a bad idea that comes with a kernel of truth because look, as parents, we all want our kids to be safe. Seat belts and car seats, they are good things. But as Aristotle said, any virtue taken to its extreme becomes a vice. And when safety is taken to its extreme, it can not only crush risk taking and personal exploration, but really threaten American freedom itself. And I think we've experienced that firsthand with the response to the pandemic, both here and around the world. So if you raise your kids to believe, Safety comes first. Safety is everything. Better that you miss out on any amount of experience than that you take any risk. Most of us want our kids to be a force in the world. We want them to have an effect on the world. We want them to be leaders. We want them to stand up to injustice. We want them to fix things, build things, innovate, take risks. But if they don't have practice taking risks and taking chances, if they don't develop the confidence that they can go into the unknown and come back, then they're not going to lead bold, innovative, or perhaps even important lives. Before I get to the final bad idea, a good idea would be to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. And now, number one, and perhaps the most important bad idea to unlearn, is that life is a battle between good and evil people. One of the essential elements of Jonathan Haidt's work is a recognition that as human beings, we are kind of fundamentally groupish. We're tribal, we've evolved in tribes and in groups, and so we're kind of hardwired to see the world as a zero-sum game. If I have more, you must have less. If you look different than me, or you're from a different tribe than I am, you are a threat to me. You are wrong, you're bad, you're evil even. Evil, actually. Doctor, evil. This is a terrible way to look at our fellow human beings and at the world. If these are the ideas that young people are exposed to, they're going to fear new situations, trust the panic or negative feelings that arise in them, and see life as a zero-sum battle between groups. This is pretty much a recipe for anxiety and failure. This is a recipe for fearing new things, for not being able to cooperate with others. I think it's a matter of actually national importance that we stop doing what we're doing, that we stop messing up kids by overprotecting them. So I've been studying political civility and polarization since the early 2000s. I'm very alarmed. We have a lot of problems in this country. The kids may not be able to handle this mess of a country that we're bequeathing to them. This is not conducive to the spirit of liberty. When Alexis de Tocqueville traveled around America in the early 1830s, he observed something uh, that, he was, that he was amazed by. He observed that Americans, when there's a problem to be solved, they just get together and figure out how to solve it. Sort of the Ben Franklin spirit. He noted in Democracy in America that in France, people would just wait for the king or the government to do it. And in Britain, they would wait for the nobles or the royalty to do it. The common people don't have an internal locus of control. The common people don't feel that they can solve problems. But in America, they do. So even though a lot of the long-term trends for our country and for child rearing are bad, I'm actually optimistic that they're gonna change. We didn't understand that we were making our kids so fragile, but now there's increasing awareness that we're doing that. So I think we will see the beginnings of a counter-revolution or a movement towards giving kids the kind of independence that actually makes them strong and happy. I could go on for hours about all the things I've learned by reading and listening to and watching videos of Jonathan Haidt. He's an incredible thinker, and you've got to check out his books, The Coddling of the American Mind and The Righteous Mind, and we'll leave links to both below. They are really transformative in helping you understand the world. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to join the conversation, leave a comment below, and remember to subscribe to the channel so you can explore all the other videos we've got here at Dad Saves America. I appreciate you sticking around, and hope to see you next time. Thank you.